Ah, this this chimney, it uh, it once belonged to a paper mill, uh, but according to neighbours round here at the older end, like you know, it shut in 1920s, and then became various other things, you know, afterwards. But I often wonder when I were a little lad why this chimney were always bright red, and and you know never black like all the other ones round here. This is the when this is gone, there's only one more left in this town when it's gone this yeah it, it is a grand example of a of a sort of factory chimney you know it, it's built out of Accrington bricks and there's not a crack in it nothing wrong with it you know it's a pity you can't pick them up and take them around and sell them you know no one or two people who buy this but alas you can't move them around you know once they're on the floor they're a bit of a mess aren't they <laughs> there's not a lot left of the works is there you know <laughs> They had one of them there fires and it's disappeared completely so chimney were no good before the only reason it stayed here was because it were in such an awkward place now is the opportunity to get rid of it uh, you know and, and then they can have a fresh start on this uh, very valuable site When we're not sat on tops of chimneys, you know, we spend a great deal of time uh, knocking the things down and, and basically here what we're doing today is we've removed a, a section of the brickwork from the base of the chimney stack and we're replacing that with wooden props and wedges and cap pieces as you can see. And then when we've removed the you know remainder of the brickwork, basically we set fire to the, the timber and uh, down comes the chimney stack. Uh, this method really in confined places compares very favourably with the dynamite men because you don't get bricks blowing out all over the uh, all over the neighbourhood. Where it's going to go is if anywhere slightly that way. How long will it take once you set fire? Once I set fire to this, I will take a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes. Where's the time going? Right, well, it's vacuum stations. Like the hardest thing really is controlling the crowd, you know, because in, in these places, as you can see around here, there's walls sticking up and all sorts of things, and people have a nasty habit of just bobbing up from behind a wall when the thing's about to fall down, which is a bit nasty. You see, when you when you blow things up, the, the it's like five, four, three, two, one, boom, and it's all over with, whereas here we've like 20 minutes of... Uh, nerve-wracking thought before the thing actually falls over. Here, we're having a bit of bother getting the fire going. <laughs> so you need a bit of a torch of this nature to, you know, get the, get the wood and all the all the diesel oil and the and the rags going really good because uh, you've got to get it burning fairly <laughs> uniformly across the front of the chimney stack once you have lit it it's out of your hands then it's uh, in the hands of that guy upstairs you know uh, not a lot of room here as you can see we were all about four feet off one wall and, and we'd knocked it all through a wall to fire the chimney through the hole uh, it went very well actually we didn't even knock any of the remainder of the walls down All the wood were wet, it were being particularly stubborn that day, you know, as a rule, it's generally blazing away by now. We didn't do too well, you know. The whole place had burned down the works and the fire brigade had done the bit wetting all the wood through. There we go, it's taking over now quite well. Going! 
as a rule, it's about quarter of an hour to 20 minutes, I think. I think that one weren't, weren't very far out on that bush. Another one gone. Well, indeed, I'm quite pleased because where the, where the flue all were, where the smoke went in, you see, it were yeah. like sort of two foot of brickwork missing, which we could have done with. Yeah. And, and of course, we propped that up with a big bark of timber. And did you see how it twisted round when it when it went? You know, it, oh, well, yeah, it, so well, you it, mean, it actually yeah. rolled round on that piece of wood, you know, stood on a, on a big pin, yeah. as you might say. I often do jobs for my friends on, on their engines when they're a bit stuck and, and uh, here we're, we're retubing this little steam tractor in readiness for a trip over the mountains into Yorkshire for the, for the Manchester to Arrogate Vintage Vehicle Run next weekend and I think it's the first time that a traction engine's ever done it. Uh, so I've got to get it right for next Friday and here we are expanding the tubes which the thing that we stick down the end is the piece of iron termed as the dolly. The boiler tubes are always bigger at the front end than the than the back end. There's Neil putting the dolly back in the fire. Um, Now there's my mate Neil taking the burrs off the end of the tube so they go down the hole a lot easier, you know. It's amazing if you just have a little bit of a burr on the end and the tubes are good fit in the hole, it won't go in. Uh, so that takes care of that. There's the shaft going round and all the belts flapping in the wind. Um, and there's the engine that we've got to get ready for Friday. There are 32 inch and three quarter outside diameter tubes to stick in it. I think here on the lathe we're actually making uh, a new drift to knock the things in with, you know, because you, you, you down at the end with an hammer it'll, it'll mess them up, you know, burr them over and make a bit of a mess of them. And our steam driven lathe. It's not many people got a steam driven way in this day and age. What we're doing now really is, is knocking the tubes in and, you know, sort of ready to do the expanding. And they're a bit, they're a little bit tight in firebox, so it's better be tight than slight because when we put the tube expanders in and they start, you know, if all the tube starts going round, you're in trouble, why? Well, there's no way these are going to go round because they're just just that nice, got a nice grip in the tube, in the firebox end and all. In fact, they're a good fit in every end, you know, the expanding we did at the front is also a good fit, you know. It, normally you stick them up the hole and you can wabble them about sort of style. Um, we've just, what you might call, got it right, you know, there's no daylight showing. You can generally tell if you put a lamp inside, you can see chinks of, of you know, a, a light shining through the through the gap. Uh, I presume we've got some expanders. Yeah, we've got some expanders. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. A bit of a crude method, but it works. Yeah. You get a bit tired after after you've lifted that up half a day. <laughs> Today's the big day when we're going to take the engine back to its uh, rightful owner who lives about six or seven miles down the road, you know. So uh, we're now going to be shortly lighting the fire and going round with the oil can and getting it all ready for the journey. Uh, first, the first move is to drag it out of the shed. So, because uh, we used to have a chimney on the roof but it fell down, so you don't want to fill the shed up with smoke. <laughs> So we'll drag it outside and light the fire. With our Land Rover, our trusty servant. So 
only a teeny engine, so the Land Rover will pull it quite easily. And it's a bit, bit of a downhill out of the shed anyway, so it ain't too bad. It's an Aveling Porter tractor, which were built about, I think, you know, 1919 or 1920. Um, I remember the guy buying it, and uh, I helped him to put a new firebox in it and a new front tube plate, and uh, made a new tender, and uh, did, he's done quite a lot of work on it. It's a very good engine, though. It was very fast. Uh, a racing machine. There's young Jack enjoying himself. Mm. Yeah. Tomorrow we're going to this bloody tracking engine rally. This morning we've got to take this tracking engine back to Bury. And uh, it'll be dinner time is when we get back line. Uh, yeah, so oh, yeah, make sure nobody next up. Yeah, there's Jack. It's amazing how much Jack's learned, uh, considering he's only four years old. You know, he knows all the names of all the parts of the engines uh, and where everything goes. Give him an oil can and he uh, puts it all in the right place. <laughs> You can see why steam engines really went out of fashion. It takes about an hour to get one going, sort of style. Uh, oh, there's our friend from the BBC come giving us a lift. Uh, we have lots and lots of visitors from all walks of life, from the most humble to the very rich, you know, noble men as well. Like, just doing a job on an engine that belongs to uh, and his lordship gent. Ah, steam coming out of the safety valves. Ready, movement, we're off. We'll give it a trial run down the road first, I think, see how it performs. When I have a ride on that one, it always urges me on to uh, have a do at my own, because my own tractor is a very similar machine to uh, to what this one is, but slightly bigger. Uh, it's got bigger wheels, so it'll go faster. There's one for sale in the world's fur this week at 23, sorry, 32,000 <laughs> pounds. Just the same as what this is. Or oh, very similar.
seven, I think it is, and uh, you know, this is really what it's all about. Um, you know, really enjoy this this business. In fact, really, it, it, it's one of England's best tourist attractions. Now, there's basically thousands of people come to these do's every weekend uh, during the summer time. You know, I, I never realised there were that many people filled up with nostalgia and steam <laughs> for steam engines. Uh, um, you know, it, it, over the last 20 years, it's really come on heavy, this stuff. I mean, now people are paying literally thousands of pounds for a ride like this set of gallopers, which, of course, they, they were so big and so hard to move about in the old days, they couldn't get rid of them fast enough, the fairground men, for one that, like, falls up and uh, shuts away into one box on the back of a wagon. That creation there is, is what's termed as a portable engine, which of course is working a stone crusher, which is a machine for smashing rocks up into making it into ballast, which is dead handy, you know, especially if you have a big long drive and you can't afford the tarmac. You know, that's a bit of a mystery, I don't know what mate that is. I know one thing, the belt's a bit slack. <laughs> Yeah, that's <laughs> that's a proverbial thrashing machine, I think. You know, I don't quite know how they work because I've never been a country boy. But you know, uh, uh, this is a bit more up my style. Sawing the wood with the with the steam engine. Like that blade must be all a five foot diameter. It's a fair old lump of iron going round. The reason for the demise of them is the thickness of the blade is so great that the time they've sawn a tree up, they've, they've sawn about three planks out of it into sawdust uh, so they've all gone in favour of the bandsaw mm. there's his lordship's machine uh, Messner Castle um, it's Mr Dennis Brandt and his big fowler robot it's not Atlas, Atlas is my uh, favourite, that one is uh, one very similar. Well, it's got wooden rims on the wheels, that cost him a lot of money and he says he gets very upset when he sees all the wood on the tarmac because you've gone along the road, <laughs> wearing them away. One's full dip I can't do that anymore, I'm too old. If I do, I suck something up in the city, isn't it? But be careful. Uh, handsome piece of tattle, that. Yeah, there's the wood, you see what I mean, you know. Oh, bits of wood coming off. Hi Luke, at it this way actually, it, it, you're doing the local water authority a service and the fire brigade as well because imagine if your house were over there and, and sometimes these hydrants are full up to the top with muck you know and when we stop 
we've got to dig all the muck out before we can get some water out of it and if your house were burning down day after and the fire you know the fire brigade arrived and, it, and we hadn't stopped there before the you know the, the precious minutes wasted when all your valuables were being melted down you see the, the thing is uh, I, I, I can't see why anybody should argue you know about us just pinching a few gallon of water I mean we're very good for the tourist trade as well and also sort of you know the, the lad who just gone by with his engine he, he were in the middle of Lancaster one day and he, he snapped one open and the top come off and it was belting up in the sky about 20 feet you know and so <laughs> water everywhere sent him a bill for 20 quid I think or something yeah. It won't be so bad if it were an easier in here. I've have the strength of... Uh, it's never been old for a long time, has it? No! That's better. <laughs> we'll send our report to the fire brigade. Boom, come on. <laughs> Take off. Of, um, the first 20 years are the worst. Mm. Mm. Such dirty things and all, and spew muck everywhere. As soon as you finish cleaning it, it was bad again after the first journey. So why do you do it then? Oh, well, I like it. It's sort of a, a love-hate relationship. All those <laughs> Five. 
Have you got any comments you wish to make about uh, Vicar this morning? He's a good singer, eh? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, he's uh, quite a boy, eh? A bit of a wisecracker. <laughs> Oh, it's not looking so bad now, we're nearly ready for the uh, the grand turnout, you know, the race round, the arena. If we can get out of this hole, you know, we don't end up with our wheels spinning round and not going nowhere. <laughs> This is Hassel Park in Cheshire near Jodrell Bank or Mattlesfield or whatever you want to put it, it which is uh, oh, a really nice attraction in Rally, one of the nicest in the north of England, uh, which I've been going there for about 15 years. The only problem is it's, it's a full day of a job from Bolton to uh, Chelford, you know, it's a, it's a fur jag on a steamroller. The tractor will be much better, we do it in about half a day on that. There's our steamroller, which was built in 1910. And uh, you can tell it's come a long way, because the wheels are shiny. And this is the Grand Parade. Uh, uh, steam engines. Which has uh, rained a bit, and uh, yeah, a bit of wheel spin. <laughs> Uh, you get stuck in a funny place. This engine is one of the biggest showman's engines that um, has survived. Um, it's a McLaren made in Leeds called Goliath. Uh, I think it weighs about 25 tonnes. Uh, it started its life off pulling big guns in the 1914 war and then ended up bought by a man called Mr Pat Collins in, in the Midlands who had a great fleet of traction engines. Uh, ended its sort of Shoreland days at Alton Towers in, in Staffordshire and purchased from there by Mr Lithgow who spent a lot of money and time on it making it into what it is today, you know, a magnificent machine. This is an Aveling tractor which has just undergone uh, severe boiler surgery and the fact it's had a new firebox and I think half a new tender and a new front tube plate. Uh, mind you, they've all done 70 years, you see, these things, and they get a bit worn out. Uh, somebody has got to spend a lot of money to bring them back to uh, runnable condition again. Even before you start with the paintbrush. Really, for somebody who owns an engine, you know, the, the actual do's are pretty what the same wherever you go, you know. Uh, a lot of people load their engines up on low loaders and zoom along at 60 mile an hour and can't get there fast enough. <laughs> but for me, I'm afraid uh, I much prefer steaming the thing all the way along the road. It, it's that sort of unforeseen encounters and minor disasters and meeting different people along the road uh, 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 make the thing um, you know quite exciting uh, you know we've, we've ended up at weddings and all sorts of things uh, uh, going along you know like little Jack he's, he's magic you know you want to try and get him off the damn thing when you you know he's screaming and shouting he don't want the day to come to an end like the engine in the background with the great crane on it that's uh, uh, ironically belongs to a man called Mr Crane who has the crane engine <laughs> and he lives in Wolverhampton he's a nice sort of guy who um, he's got quite a few engines you know there's a little teeny one you know there's a lot of them they're, they're quite expensive to buy now the 
change hands for fees like 15 and 20 thousand pounds you know depending on the quality of the model maker there's a very beautiful model really it's harder to play about with a thing like that, actually make one like that than it is mess with the real thing, you know, other than the fact that everything's nice and light but three times as fiddly to make one. That's Steam's answer to the diesel road roller, a Wallace and Stevens advance road roller, which has no flywheel so you could put it in reverse quick it didn't sink in the tarmac like a three-point standard roller with a flywheel by the time you stop the flywheel going round the thing has actually sunk down into the tarmac <laughs> and so it, it it put paid to three-point steam driven roll rollers and the the Wallace were the last attempt to uh, overcome this but alas, the diesel engine won. Mm. There's our friendly policeman on his bike. steamroller in a wet field slows about like a bar of soap on a wet sink you can't stop the thing that's an airline steam tractor going very fast pursued by the police <laughs> Quite funny, this. <laughs> He's been on the beer again. <laughs> Somebody throwing coal at him. <laughs> Some people actually think this is real, you know. <laughs> Lost his bike you now. Yeah, some handcuffs and all, you know, they don't half hurt, they're a bit on the small side, you know, and he puts them on and pinches all whiskers on, you know. He, he, this guy is actually still a policeman, I believe, and, uh, you know, it's nice to see, like, this sort of public relations <laughs> exercise.